Um, my topic today is um, polyamorous families, um, parenting practice, stigma, and social regulation. Um, I would just like to say at the beginning, I'm not a parent myself. Um, I have discussed, you know, the option of uh, parenting with um, ex-partners in the past, and also um, with friends or with partners or ex-partners of partners. But ultimately, I've always been kind of too reluctant to embark on that uh, journey. But um, I find that um, issue very, very interesting and uh, politically highly relevant. And it popped up quite early in my research um, when I did research discourses on non-monogamy and polyamorous parenting in the UK um, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. <coughs> when there was strong evidence um, that some poorly parents um, experienced uh, a lot of discrimination with child protection services. So I consider parenting, mothering, fathering, and the connection between non-monogamy and um, raising children uh, uh, yeah, highly important, and it's uh, um, a moment where a lot of power crystallizes. Um, I would like to talk a bit about um, the history of research um, on polyamory. Um, research on polyamory has been around since uh, the 1990s. Um, the field has cons consolidated um, in the early and mid 2000s. Um, a few special issues have been published on polyamory and polyamorous relationships, um, including the Journal for Lesbian Studies, Journal of Bisexuality, Sexualities, and the German-English bilingual journal for, um, for psychology. Recently, uh, we've seen a lot of, you know, um, monographs, research being published in, um, yeah, highly respectable uh, university presses. Um, research seems to be Farly, um, by far limited uh, to Europe, North America, and other uh, European colonial settler societies. Um, also, polyamory communities have been vocal and have articulated um, their political voices and have been organized in other countries. I'm personally not familiar with larger studies um, that have been published, which um, is probably uh, partially to blame on my uh, yeah, limited linguistic uh, competencies as well, and I'm happy if you could have a discussion about um, yeah, the prevalence of polyamory um, in other um, parts of the world. Um, the research on polyamory has been, uh, has kind of tapped into a lot of new territories. Um, however, um, parenting and non-monogamy has until very recently um, been a gap in that literature. And apart from, let's say, a few paragraphs or maybe a small chapter in um, early pioneering work on polyamory, there has not been a great deal um, of discussion. So um, only since um, the two, um, yeah, at the end of the first decade of the 2000s, uh, we see slowly um, research into, pol uh, into polyamory and parenting, or into consensual non-monogamy and parenting, pouring out. Um, okay. Um, what I find kind of quite interesting is um, that some of this research, um, which has been published, um, on polyamory and parenting, um, mainly Elizabeth Sheff studies um, the polyamorous next door, um, explicitly um, draws comparison, comparisons between poly parenting and LGBT uh, parenting or lesbian gay parenting, which is the phrase she mostly um, is um, using. And um, while I think a lot can be gained from asking questions uh, about comparison, um, I would also like to emphasize that um, 
lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, um, and polyamorous or consensual non-monogamous are not mu mu uh, mutually exclusive um, categories. And very often um, these words um, are blurred and these kind of relationship forms are blurred um, or people have multiple identities and are part of uh, multiple communities. Uh, Chef and Hammers define polyamory as a form of association in which people openly maintain multiple romantic, sexual, and or affective relationships. Um, so many people talk about polyamory as a relationship orientation or a relationship philosophy. It is not in any way connected to sexual orientation in quotation marks in its more classical sense of um, uh, gendered preference of partner choice. Um, however, some research suggests that um, polyamory communities or movements um, in certain locations, in certain cities or certain countries, um, kind of mm, are sort of, have kind of, sorry, how difficult to say that, um, are kind of moored in certain sexual identity um, communities. So, for example, Elizabeth Sheff's research uh, would frequently stress that the communities in the northwest of the United States and in the uh, Californian Bay areas she studied would be predominantly heterosexual and there would be a few bisexual people and so on. Um, there's also kind of conflicts between polyamorous polyamor people and LGBT organizations around pride demonstrations and so on have also been widely documented. However, that notwithstanding, I would like to emphasize that a lot of research into polyamory um, has documented um, polyamory within lesbian communities, polyamory within queer women's communities, um, polyamory within bisexual communities, and so on. So I personally don't think a lot is to be gained if um, we think about consensual non-monogamy and polyamory um, as being moored in certain um, identity categories when constructing a closure around these identities. Um, polyamory as a way of life or as a relationship choice cuts across um, different identity categories and um, I think it is worthwhile to approach it from that point. Um, I would like to say a few words about um, polyparenting <coughs> research um, and the kind of genres in which uh, or writing about polyparenting has been um, articulated so far. Um, there's a lot of um, research, small-scale research, um, which is partially still in progress, uh, which is undertaken by um, postdoctoral fellows or um, postgraduate students um, across Europe and in other countries. Um, there's a lot of work in popular press and guidebooks. Um, there's a lot of autobiographical narrative, which partially is included in uh, guidebooks on how to live a polyamorous relationship, um, or which has been published as part of um, more activist-based um, volumes. Um, and then there are a lot of narratives from within popular culture, novels, TV, cinema, films, and so on. Uh, Maria Paloda Chiaroli uh, has been quite good in um, including analysis of this work in her um, publication and her research work. Um, so the aim of my paper today is um, to look at that emerging body of work and to uh, present a sketchy preliminary diagnostics, diagnostics of some of the salient problems and front lines um, that shape the experience of polyparenting um, within consensually non-monogamous uh, family settings. And I also would like to, you know, to, uh, to validate um, the, yeah, the achievements of some of the pioneering research um, into poly parenting. I will primarily concentrate on 
the research um, literature and I want to look at parenting practices, social and legal discrimination and parenting response to stigmatization. Um, and I will strongly dr uh, draw upon two publications which are, according to my knowledge, are the kind of the, the largest and most comprehensive studies which have been conducted on polyamory um, so far. Uh, one is a book by Elizabeth Schaff um, and also a range of research publications, articles which she has published before the book, um, which um, draws on research she has conducted since uh, 2006. Um, it is based on more than 130 um, interviews in the United States and participant observation, including more than 500 um, people. Um, the research sample she is talking about um, is by herself described as predominantly white and uh, consisting of highly educated professionals. Another book I will uh, strongly uh, draw upon is um, the excellent study Border Sexualities and Border Families in Schools by Maria Palotta Pierroli, um, who um, looks at bisexual students and polyamorous or multisexual families and their experiences of educational institutions. Um, her work is um, quite reflective um, of also ethnic minority people's experiences or um, at times also indigenous uh, people's experiences. Um, her work covers um, polyamory and bisexuality in Australia. Um, both of these works and a lot of you know, the other research I will not exclusively um, discuss in this paper highlight positive aspects um, of polyamory and um, describe um, the resilience of poly families to kind of survive and make their way um, in the face of discrimination and um, oppression, but also emphasize um, the kind of positive environment polyamorous polyamory community um, parenting groups and networks can create um, for children. Um, polyamory is, um, does not prescribe any template um, for relationship constellations. Theoretically, uh, there are myriads and thousands of ways in which people could practice um, polyamory or consensual non-monogamy. So I was quite struck when I found the following quote in Elizabeth Chef's study. The most common form of polyfamily seems to be an open couple with children, two people in a long-term relationship who often live together and have additional sexual relationship. And you know, she would come back to that issue over and over again in her book, emphasizing that um, open uh, couple relationships would not only be um, the most common form of poly parenting, uh, but they would also be the most stable, would provide the most stable um, poly parenting um, constellations. Because um, more complex networks like tr um, triads and quads and more sums, which also exist and which she also studied, would have a sort of stronger fl uh, fluidity um, and more partners entering and exiting and so on. Um, other books, um, like for example, um, Fu and uh, Rickard's um, guidebook on um, polyamorous relationships, I think it's called More Than Two, would come up with similar claims. Many relationships would be based on a so-called V model. Uh, primary and secondary partnership uh, distinctions would be quite common. Many polyamorous people are also married um, within a heterosexual marriage framework, meaning kind of another sex marriage framework. Um, doesn't say anything about the sexual identity of the people involved. Um, Chef and others also emphasize um, that kind of quite conventional um, family terms are sometimes used within polyamory families um, to refer to 
parenting or non-parenting, um, metamorphs, um, non-biological parents within a polyamorous constell constellations. Uh, Chef frequently um, com compares, um, you know, certain poly parents um, as step parents, or the term uncles and aunties are frequently used. These are all terms which are kind of known from a, you know, largely heteronormative um, biological bio-legal um, family framework. No <laughs> um, okay. Virtually all texts I looked at um, sort of stressed um, the significance of um, poly um, parenting practices um, to redefine and um, to create um, and to grow family bonds. So, um, Chef and others emphasize um, polyamory is particularly vital in, in creating and expanding uh, family, in creating extended family networks, um, um, in drawing multiple adults into the care um, of children. Um, it is kind of quite interesting that uh, Chef um, offers a new term in order to talk about some qualities of polyparentic relationships. Uh, she talks a lot about polyaffectivity, uh, which are the times, the binds that hold polyparenting families together and which are sustained by everyday practices of intimacy and care, um, but which are ultimately non sexual. So, um, polyamory, according to Chef, would refer to a sort of more um, sexual bonding between people, drawing on erotic love, whereas uh, polyaffectivity is um, a term she relates to uh, partners um, who are not necessarily sexual involved with everyone in a parenting um, network. Um, what is kind of quite interesting here, I find, is a kind of a strong emphasis also on desexualizing um, the the core poly monogamous parenting relationship, um, claiming that poly affective, poly affective ties would also be um, longer lasting, more durable um, than um, poly amorous relationships. Um, that in turn shows that the connection of non monogamy in bracket sexuality and parenting is highly potential and at the core of anti-polyamory um, sentiment and um, is given as a legitimation for a lot of the discriminatory and oppressive practices towards um, consensual non-monogamous um, parenting groups and families. It is also kind of quite interesting that a lot of the work um, on, or a lot of the research on polyparenting sort of is set up um, as a kind of juxtaposition or kind of a comparison of the benefits of polyamory and also um, then also a discussion of the potential problems and um, difficulties of um, polyamory. Um, Maria Palotta Chiaroli uh, sort of these in that um, approach um, also a kind of an attempt very often by you know, research participants, by polyamorous parents themselves, to create a positive image um, of, their, of their relationship, um, kind of an attempt at passing it perfect, um, which according uh, to Palotti uh, Chiaroli also extends um, to children who very often uh, feel under pressure to prevent themselves as you know, very healthy, quite normal in order not to further stigmatize um, their family environment. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through you know, these <laughs> different um, benefits of um, polyamory um, as described by Elizabeth Schaff, Maria Palotti Chiaroli and others. Um, the difficulties, it's kind of quite interesting, are in a way divided between 
um, family internal problems, uh, which may be uh, related um, to the complexity of multi-adult relationships, the constraints of space, um, complex dynamics within blended uh, families, which bring different partners in, um, and so on. The last two items on this list, rejection by families of origin, um, and also um, a kind of quite common um, difficulty, according to Chef, that uh, people in a teenage, teenagers at times um, go through periods when they are very resentful of having been denied um, uh, an experience of growing up in a normal and proper family, um, already point towards social problems which are not located uh, within the family itself, but um, which are, in the wider sense, societal problems and social and legal problems. Um, and I can only um, recommend um, Maria Palotti-Chiaroli's book uh, on border sexualities um, and border families at schools, because she does an excellent job in showing how uh, stigma and um, social oppression and um, the incompetence of educational institutions um, and including the staff who works at educational institutions such as the universities and schools to deal with minority um, experiences of you know, bisexual kids and uh, people being raised in uh, multi-adult families or poly families um, makes the life of many of these teenagers um, hell. Um, Chef and Kiroli go on also to document um, a lot of poly pan uh, poly problems for poly parents um, and poly family um, are of a legal kind. And um, sort of there are examples um, of research participants um, having been um, hunted down with uh, threats of criminalization due to the use of adultery laws, anti bigamy laws, um, but then there's also a lack of um, formal family rights which made um, polyamorous families but also individuals within them um, quite vulnerable at the point of crisis. Um, Palota Chiaroli sort of shows that poly families develop very, um, very sophisticated ways of dealing with these threats, um, which range from passing over bordering uh, kind of um, um, complex negotiations of private and public and hostile and friendly spaces um, to polluting. And polluting means um, just poly parents or by teenagers and poly teenagers who are very out about their lifestyle um, and try to change their environment in schools um, that way. And that brings me to the conclusion um, poly parenting is a vibrant and vital creative approach to intimacy, parenting, and care. Um, mononormativity, sex negativity, and what Baird calls child fundamentalism, the idea that everything has to be organized uh, for the sake and for the uh, goodness uh, and the well-being of the child, um, stigmatize poly parents and very often undermine um, the coherence and the well-being of poly families. Um, we experience a moment when more and more um, poly people and people in consensual non-monogamous relationships speak up um, and it, you know, educate society or engage in political activism. More research is needed that explores details of discrimination, um, but also that um, documents how poly amorous people and families um, organize concrete um, care work in, as a form of a division of labor. Um, in order to yeah, understand 
both the normative and the subversive transgressive potential of polyparenting much better. Thank you. <laughs>